As a channel teaching perfumery, that is, the art of making perfumes, I often hear from people who believe that synthetic fragrances are harmful and bad for you, and you should always make or use natural perfumes. So in this video, I thought I would investigate how much truth there is in those statements, and really try to uncover the actual levels of danger of both natural and synthetic perfumes. Take a quick look at articles about synthetic fragrance online, and you'll quickly find dramatic headlines and claims such as, these chemicals include benzene derivatives, aldehydes, phthalates, and a slew of other known toxins that are capable of causing cancer, birth defects, nervous system disorders, and allergies, some of which are cited on the EPA's hazardous waste list, as well as, Artificial fragrances contain numerous synthetic chemicals which are derived from petroleum. This means these products contain gasoline, diesel fuel, asphalt, heating oil, jet fuel, waxes, lubricating oils, and petrochemical feedstocks. Shocking, right? Now, when looking at articles online, it's important to take a step back for a moment and think about who's actually writing them. And that's because on both sides of the fence, there are companies who make either natural or synthetic fragrances who are writing these articles. As well as that, anyone can write an article online these days, meaning that you get articles from people who don't even know what they're talking about, and therefore there's always a chance that the article you're reading is actually just plain wrong. In this video, I thought we would stay as close as possible to the actual research done by scientists, because these people know what they're talking about, and they're also much less likely to have conflicting interests causing them to try to push a product, either containing naturals or synthetics. I will leave a lot of links for the various articles and papers that I'm referencing in the description of this video. So if there's anything I say that you're not fully sure about or you wanna know where it comes from, then check in the description and you should be able to find something to back up what I'm saying. So then, let's begin. After looking through some of these articles, I thought I would take a look at the most common offenders that pop up time and time again, and now we're gonna go through them and see how dangerous they are. So the first one that a lot of articles mention is simply chemicals. A lot of perfumes contain chemicals. And why would you want a perfume if it contains a load of chemicals? That can't be healthy, right? Well, the truth is not so clear cut, and it all stems from the definition of chemicals. Looking at the Cambridge Dictionary, their definition for chemicals is as follows. Chemical, any basic substance that is used or produced by a reaction involving changes to atoms or molecules. That means almost any pure substance you can think of is a chemical, including water, which we need to survive. Glucose, the sugar molecule in your bloodstream, is also a chemical, and again, we need that to survive. So what's really bad is the harmful chemicals, things like benzene, which certainly have negative health effects. There are some potentially harmful chemicals which have actually been found in perfumes, and a lot of these are frequently mentioned in these articles, so I thought we would go through the most commonly mentioned ones. And we'll start off with styrene. So looking at these articles, you'll see that styrene is associated with a lot of bad health effects, one of them being cancer. But if you go and look at the actual evaluations by professionals on styrene and its negative health effects, what you'll find is that firstly, it's a skin irritant and that is pretty relevant to perfumes because you know, they are on your skin. It is also known to have other harmful health effects, especially in high doses. But the real risk of these applies to people working in factories, especially rubber and plastics factories, who are actually exposed to large amounts of styrene. Now there is some research pointing to styrene potentially having a link to cancer. The thing about styrene though is, while I can definitely see that you wouldn't want any higher levels of this stuff in perfumes, I can't actually see any evidence that any high levels of this stuff are found in perfumes in the first place. The stuff just doesn't smell nice, so if you put it in your perfume, it would ruin it. If you go ahead and look at Fragrance Drama, a popular Instagram page with the GCMS analysis, that's the chemical breakdowns of perfumes, if you go and look through a load of them, at least from the ones that I had to look through, I didn't see styrene on any of them. Looking at the official assessment for styrene by the RIFM, that's the Research Institute for Fragrance Materials, the leading professional body looking at fragrance safety in the world, we can actually see that the levels of styrene across the market in fragrances are extremely low. 95% of fragrances on the market contain less than 0.000089% concentration of styrene. Essentially, it's just a completely trace impurity that's less than one molecule in a million being styrene. The analysis mentions that styrene is also naturally found in the environment. It's found in things like shrimps, wine, beer, and coffee. 
Now the only reason that I can see that any significant amounts of styrene would really crop up in a fragrance is if you are actually using something like Styrax resinoid, that's a natural raw material coming from a tree which naturally contains styrene. In fact, the one I've got here has most of the styrene removed. Styrax, it turns out, is also where styrene actually got its name from in the first place. So. Styrene and perfumes, it's not really a thing unless you're using something which is unnatural anyway. From what I can tell, all of these mentions by these articles about styrene and synthetic fragrances is essentially just scaremongering and misunderstanding on their part. And if you are thinking about avoiding synthetic fragrances because of styrene, then you should also consider avoiding natural fragrances because again, they can contain styrene. Another thing frequently mentioned by these articles as present in fragrances are phthalates. And these are mentioned as endocrine disruptors, meaning they actually disrupt the hormones inside your body. Now, the only phthalate that's actually widely used in fragrance is something called DEP, or diethyl phthalate. Now, the EC, or European Commission, a big legislative body in Europe who passed lots of legislation, and part of that is fragrance legislation aimed at keeping people safe, well, they did an analysis in 2002 and concluded that diethyl phthalate was safe to use in fragrances. Move forward to 2005 when Greenpeace did an investigation into fragrances where they went and looked at 36 different fragrances in the market and analyzed the levels of various things, including phthalates inside of them. They concluded from that study that these uh, dangerous endocrine disruptors, as they said, were present in fragrances and the legislation wasn't doing enough to combat that. This caused a load of articles to come out suddenly saying that all of these dangerous phthalates are present in fragrances and may be causing endocrine disruption. So in response to this, the IFRA, the International Fragrance Association, who published safety guidelines for what can be put into perfumes, they had to publish a statement saying that DEP, or diethyl phthalate, as far as they're concerned with the latest research, is completely fine and isn't an endocrine disruptor. Now, this statement from the IFRA didn't really stop all of this information coming out online about these endocrine disruptors in fragrances. So a couple of years later, in 2007, the EC, who had originally done their analysis on DEP, got their special scientific committee to do an updated review into all of the claims that Greenpeace made in their article. They found that apart from DEP, the other phthalates mentioned in this study and the ones that are actually dangerous weren't actually added as ingredients to the fragrances, they were just simply minor trace impurities. And they also said that additionally, some legislation had been passed since that study banning certain phthalates. And because the study was done before that, it didn't necessarily reflect the updated legislation. They went on to explain that these trace levels of phthalates found inside the perfumes are most likely actually from the plastic itself in the spray pump atomizers. And that's because phthalates are commonly used as plasticizers, i.e. they're found inside of plastics, meaning that any plastics, including the spray pumps, may contain amounts of these phthalates. And therefore, it's not actually the fragrance itself that's causing the phthalates, it's simply the packaging which they're in. Now, this was all 20 years ago. And despite that, there are still articles on this topic, yet there hasn't been an update from either the EC or the IFRA since then. DEP or diethyl phthalate is still widely used in fragrances and cosmetics, so I thought I would have a look to see if there was any more modern research about that and if it actually does have any harmful effects. I found a review on the scientific literature about DEP that was published a couple of years ago, and its conclusion stated that these results suggest that DEP exposure may induce androgen-independent male reproductive toxicity, i.e. sperm effects, as well as developmental toxicity and hepatic effects with some evidence of female reproductive toxicity. More research is warranted to fully evaluate these outcomes and strengthen confidence in this database. So essentially what it's saying is that there may be some previously unknown negative effects coming from DEP, but we really just aren't sure yet and the amount of evidence on it is so small that it's not enough to be sure about it. So in my opinion, what this really shows is that Really, we just need to wait for more research to come in. One good thing here, however, is that DEP is actually used as a solvent for fragrant raw materials, and it's not really important for the perfume itself. So what I can say is if you're making your own perfumes, 
then you really don't need to go and add any DEP to your perfumes. For example, I don't add any DEP to mine, though of course it may be present in some of the bases coming from manufacturers. Because it's not vital to the actual smell, I do see a case where in the future, if they do realize that it's actually harmful to have DEP, then I'm pretty sure that the industry could really easily go and replace it. Anyway, moving on, and the next one is allergens. One article that I read states, recent health reports show that there has been a rise in asthma, migraine, sinus issues, and allergies. There is likely a correlation between the increase in synthetic fragrances and the symptoms they create. Now, it should come as no surprise that fragrances contain allergens. Allergens are found everywhere in nature, from pollen to dust mites to gluten in food. This should give us a clue about potential allergens in the things used in perfumery. Yes, in fact, a lot of things that can be used in perfumery are allergens, and this applies for both naturals and synthetics. In fact, naturals are often packed full of allergens. Linalol, a common fragrance allergen, is found in over 200 plants, including lavender, basil, and bergamot, all common essential oils which are used in perfumery. Other allergens, like limonene, citral, and geranial, are just the same. They are found in many natural essential oils. Now, don't get me wrong, synthetic fragrances are not free of this problem either. In fact, all of these molecules can equally be made as synthetic molecules instead of getting them from natural sources, and they can also be added to fragrances. Usually they're used to make accords that mimic some of these natural fragrances. So instead of, say, using lavender in your perfume or bergamot, you might want to make an accord or a smell that mimics one of those raw materials using synthetics. So you may go and use those same allergens found in the natural to reconstitute that smell. Though, of course, applied from that, they are just used in their own right as raw materials, and that's because many of those allergens, despite being allergens, they actually smell quite nice as well, and they've been used in perfumes for centuries. Now, I do just want to take a moment to call out that article from before, because while they start off by saying recent health reports show that there's been a rise in asthma and these other issues, they then go on to say completely randomly without any justification that there is likely a correlation between the increase in synthetic fragrances and the symptoms they create. Now, the problem I really have with this is that not only is it straight out a lie, because it's not synthetic fragrances in particular, it's really just fragrances full stop. This article is hosted on an online store, which is also selling products containing natural essential oils to fragrance their products. But given that the article shows that they don't really know what they're talking about, it worries me that their products containing natural essential oils may actually be containing those at unsafe levels of natural allergens. Now, the regulators do take allergens seriously. In fact, to protect consumers, the EU have a list of 26 fragrance allergens, of which if any are present in a fragrance over 0.001%, they must be declared on the ingredients label. This allows anyone with an allergy to one of those things to see it on the label and then avoid that product. And furthermore, the EU is expected in the near future to increase that list from 26 to 82, meaning even more allergens will be covered. Additionally, the IFRA, the main body for safety in fragrances, provides lots of limits to the levels at which certain natural and synthetic raw materials can be used in perfume safely, and a lot of these limits are actually based on the potential for these things to be allergens, although their limits also cover other things like toxicity. So, one thing I would recommend if you're worried about safety in fragrances is if you're making them, then definitely follow the IFRA restrictions, or if you're buying them, then look to buy for companies that follow the IFRA limits because they are voluntary. And before you ask, most big established brands do actually follow the IFRA limits. They just don't put it on their website because it's not necessarily something that most people care about. But if you do care about it, then you can always go and email the company to actually get some clarification from them. Next then, something I think is important to talk about is musks, specifically galaxolide and tonalide, because these are frequently cited by some of these articles as being dangerous in perfumes. The reason that these are so important to discuss is because unlike these phthalates, which are claimed to be in loads of perfumes, but aren't necessarily in them, or diethyl phthalate, which is in them as a solvent, but not strictly necessary to the smell itself, all of these musks, things like galaxolide and tonalide, are actually used because of their smell. So they are actually important ingredients in synthetic fragrances. Not only that, they're widespread, used in most perfumes, and they aren't subject to restriction. So I really think if there was a problem with one of these, then they really should be look at restricting or banning them. 
Now, the two classes of musks in question are polycyclic musks and nitro musks. If you want to know what those terms actually mean, then check out the video I did on musks a few months ago, because I go into detail about the different types of musks and explain exactly what they are. So many of these articles against synthetic fragrances talk about tonalide and galaxolide causing hormone or endocrine disruption, as well as potentially organ damage. Conversely, if you go and look at articles by the big companies that are selling uh, products with these synthetic musks inside, I found one by SC Johnson, and they state that they use these in their products only because the scientific evidence for all of these bad effects is very limited, and scientific bodies around the world haven't yet considered it harmful. Now, I think neither of these are the best source because they both potentially have conflicting interests, so I think it's important to look at the actual evidence. So I did a little bit of looking around and I found that one of the references for these articles talking about the negative consequences was actually an article about negative consequences in fish. Now, yes, that does show the environmental effects, but it doesn't necessarily say anything about human health because fish do function quite differently to humans. Now, I did actually manage to find one study looking at the effects of galaxolide and tonalide on cancer. And what it essentially found was that while they didn't really cause cancer, they potentially accelerated it. So I do wonder if there's more research which I've missed, but from what I can tell, it does seem that there is a real possibility that these musks may actually cause issues for people with cancer. I really think that we just need to wait and see until more research is done. And if it is something you're worried about, then you should specifically be looking for products that don't contain polycyclic musks or nitro musks. Instead of avoiding synthetic fragrances as a whole, any responsible brand should be able to tell you if these things are present in their products. Finally, I will just mention a few more chemicals which are frequently mentioned in these articles and described as being found in fragrance as well as potentially harmful. One is benzophenone, which is used as a fragrance ingredient, and it's actually used, again, like the musks, for its smell. And this one is linked to endocrine disruption and tumors. The RAFM, that research body looking at safety and fragrances, who we talked about earlier, they are currently looking at a method for trying to assess the safety of it, so I do expect that new research will come out about that soon, and if they found it to be a problem, then it will most likely be banned. BHT, or butylated hydroxytoluene, is another one that is commonly used in fragrances and this one is used as an antioxidant. Now some sources state that it may potentially be an endocrine disruptor but the EC have done an assessment on it and they've decided it's safe up to levels of 0.8% in the final product. Now if something's safe but only up to 0.8% you may ask well why is it safe at all? And well there are actually other benefits of having antioxidants in your perfume because certain things like limonene which are naturally present inside your perfume especially if you've got essential oils because because a lot of those can contain limonene, well, those things can actually break down into things like peroxides, which can actually have a really damaging effect on your body. So by having just a little bit of BHT inside your perfume as an antioxidant, it's actually helping prevent the formation of harmful peroxides. I mean, there is a reason that people say you should always eat antioxidants, right? Finally, some of these articles state that perfumes contain toluene, and to be honest, I don't really know where they're getting this from. So toluene is something that is actually harmful for you, but it's not added to perfumes, at least by any responsible manufacturer. There's just no reason to do it. It doesn't help in any way. It's literally like adding toxins to your perfumes. Now, yes, you may find tiny, tiny amounts of toluene in perfumes, but that's not because they're added, it's simply because that there is trace impurities from the manufacture of ingredients. And just in the same way that it may be found in trace impurities in perfume, if you do a quick Google for background levels of toluene, you will realize that it's just naturally present in very small amounts anyway, so there's no real way to completely avoid toluene exposure in your day-to-day -day life. The IFRA, that body for the safety on fragrances, actually has a specific on toluene in fragrances and states that toluene should always be kept absolutely as low as possible in fragrances, i.e. the only time it's acceptable is just from trace impurities which are completely unavoidable and it also states that under no circumstances should it ever exceed 100 parts per million. So now we've looked at harmful things that may be in synthetic fragrances, what about natural ones? And I think this is important to look at because a lot of these articles written by companies selling their natural products 
don't mention any of the negative effects of natural fragrance. Earlier on in the video, I mentioned that natural essential oils can contain allergens, but what I didn't mention is they can also be extremely toxic. One example of these is pennyroyal essential oil. I've actually got some right here, and it smells like, it smells like a pleasant minty scent. But did you know one teaspoon of pennyroyal essential oil can actually be enough to kill you? It's been used in herbal remedies for hundreds of years, and apparently you can make a tea out of the leaves of the pennyroyal plant, which is a type of mint, and actually make a tea which is meant to uh, bring on an abortion. There was actually a little bit of a fad about this in the 90s, which is why Nirvana made their famous song Pennyroyal Tea. Another one is wintergreen essential oil. Now, this essential oil is almost entirely made up of a single chemical called methyl salicylate. Now, it just so happens that the human body metabolizes, that means processes, methyl salicylate into something called salicylic acid, which is a known anti-inflammatory drug. In fact, by taking just one milliliter, that's about 20 drops of this wintergreen essential oil, is essentially the equivalent of taking six full strength aspirin tablets. Someone even commented on one of my YouTube videos about perfume making a couple of years ago saying, the other day I was testing a concentrated mixture I made on my hand, this mixture contained wintergreen essential oil, and my whole arm went numb and stayed that way for several hours. We've also got Fujone, which is neurotoxic, but actually naturally found in many essential oils. If you go and look at the IFRA specification on Fujone, then you can see a big list of essential oils that contain it. Finally, I wanted to bring up a story from someone in my perfume making Discord group. They said that one day they were making some food with limes and they accidentally got a load of limes around their mouth. Not thinking anything of it, they went out for a swim, and by the end of the day, their whole mouth had a massive rash around it. The reason for this is that limes, like many citrus fruits, contain something called furocoumarins, and these are actually phototoxic. Because of this, the IFRA has restrictions for many citrus fruits, including limes, and the amounts that can be used in perfumes. Essentially, these things can react with sunlight on your skin to cause a rash. That's also why bergamot essential oil, which contains a lot of these naturally, is often got them taken out, which is why we use a bergamot BF or bergaptine free version, bergaptine being one of those furocoumarins. So then, at the end of the day, looking at it all, what can we gather from this truckload of information about safety and fragrance? Well, firstly, I'll make a quick disclaimer that I'm no expert on this topic. I'm just looking at what I found online. It is possible that I misreference or said something slightly wrong from all of this information, so don't take my word as final. Do your own research and consult a professional where necessary. What I will say is, in my opinion, the whole thing does remind me a little bit about bacon. And the reason for that is studies have shown that bacon can pose a little bit of a risk to cancer. And it seems like there's a similar thing with fragrance. It does seem like some of these ingredients, things like some of these musks potentially cause cancer and we're not really sure enough about it yet. And there may also be other ingredients, both natural and synthetic, that can contribute to things like cancer and other health effects that we may just not know about. Now, the reason I liken it to bacon is despite there being research that we'd probably be slightly better off if we didn't have bacon than had it, some people still decide that despite the risks of bacon, it's worth taking the risk for the enjoyment they get out of it. And I would say it's a similar thing for fragrance. There are always gonna be risks with fragrance, just like anything else, but it's up to you to decide if you think those risks are worth it for you. If you really enjoy perfumes, then it may well be worth taking that risk, knowing that we do have lots of people looking at the safety of fragrances, and if we found something that was suddenly really harmful, it would probably get banned or restricted. On the other hand, if even just taking a tiny risk is not worth smelling a bit different to you, then maybe it's best to avoid fragrance entirely. One thing I do think is clear, however, after looking at all of this research though, is there's really no reason to believe that natural fragrance is any safer than synthetic fragrance. Natural fragrance has just as many things that may be dangerous about it. As far as I'm aware, the safest thing you can do is look to use fragrances from brands which follow the IFRA guidelines, i.e. guidelines made by professionals aimed at keeping fragrances safe. And if you are like me, someone who makes perfumes, then I think you should go and follow those guidelines. Now, if you are additionally worried about things like DEP or galaxolide, tonalide, things that the research hasn't been completely conclusive on yet, then you should just look to avoid those specific things. You don't necessarily have to discount fragrance as a whole, be it natural or synthetic. 
Usually, if you're worried about that, then what you can do is get in touch with the brand and ask them specifically if those things are present in those products. Though I guess, of course, you do need to have a trustworthy brand because an untrustworthy brand may just lie to you and say they don't use them when they in fact do. Anyway, it's been a long video, so I'll leave it at that. I actually learned a fair amount making this video. Hopefully you learned something from it too. Now I will leave as many links as possible to some of the sources, both the articles claiming some of this information, as well as some of the scientific research about it. And I'll try to leave all of that in the description so that you can actually go and fact check all of this stuff yourself. Don't take my word for it, go and do your own research. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you're interested in more videos about actually making perfume and other things related to making perfume, then definitely subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos because I release new videos just like this fairly often. So if you're interested in having those come into your YouTube subscription feed, then like and subscribe and they're more likely to be pushed to you in the future. Thank you for watching the video and I will see you next time. This video is sponsored by Luxeterra, my online store where you can find all of the essential equipment for perfumery. Only good quality and good value for money products make the cut and I use almost all of the products myself when making perfumes for my brand. To browse the full range of products, visit www.lux-terra.co.uk or click the link in the description.